Hostility against churches is on the rise in the United States. So says a new report from the Family Research Council, an important ministry in Washington, D.C. I am joined today on Grace and Truth by my dear friend, David Clausen. We are going to be discussing this very important report that has largely gone unnoticed in the mainstream media. Uh, David, welcome to the podcast. Hey, great to be with you, Owen. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. You are now a two-time guest to everyone out there. Welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand. I will be your host. Please subscribe to the podcast on all platforms. David, uh, I know that you were not the author of this Family Research Council report that just dropped in February 2024. Ariel Del Turco is the author. She works at FRC, as uh, do you uh, full time. I'm a senior fellow at FRC in the Center for Biblical Worldview. So very thankful for the ministry of FRC and the broader work and the work, the excellent work you do at the center uh, at the council. What would you say as we begin this discussion? Uh, w- what precipitated this report from FRC, uh, as you understand it. Yeah, absolutely. And I have personally studied this as well. And as you know, I'm working on a dissertation right now on civil disobedience and uh, have thought, you know, uh, as we continue to live in a post-Christian world uh, where Christian uh, ideas and belief and basic doctrine is increasingly uh, less understood I think we're seeing a a rise in these kinds of things. But this report particularly, I think this is the third iteration of the report. We first did a study in December of 2022. Um, because just, you know, uh, hearsay, you, you hear, you have conversations with pastors around the country and we, we were hearing of, uh, discussions about vandalism and arson and other acts of hostility towards churches. And so we kind of wanted to find out, well, is there kind of data, empirical data to back this up? And uh, so that's what led to this study. Uh, my colleague, Ariel Del Turco, who's kind of the main author, she's actually appeared before a subcommittee, uh, at the House of Representatives to talk about uh, this report as well. And uh, the, the data has borne out kind of what we were intuiting, I guess you could say, Owen, is that there has been a steep increase over the last six years of acts of violence and hostility uh, directed towards houses of worship and churches. Uh, the top line number is that in the last six years, uh, there's been 915 documented cases of hostility against churches. And we can get into some of the specifics, uh, but that is double. Um, well, I guess uh, I should back up a little bit, Owen. Just last year, uh, it was 436 acts uh, just last year. Uh, and that was double of what it was the previous year. So we're seeing a rapid acceleration in uh, targeted attacks against churches uh, all over the country. Yeah, I I noted that in the report. Again, the report for listeners and viewers is called Hostility Against Churches is on the Rise in the United States, just dropped February 2024 from Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. Really important ministry, really important uh, public policy work being done by FRC. This is one of the really important things that FRC does, David, because frankly, I don't sense that there are a lot of voices out there that even want to give attention to this kind of matter. I want to talk with you in a few minutes about what is called a negative world environment that we're in. We're not going to go there quite yet. But that stat that you said, um, and I'm reading from the report here, in 2023, Family Research Council identified 436 incidents against churches, more than double the number identified in 2002, and more than eight times the number identified in 2018. Eight times the number of acts against churches in 2018. David, that is an absolutely striking acceleration. Oh, no, it it absolutely is, Owen. And I think we really started uh, focusing on a lot of this during the summer of 2020. Uh, You will remember the, uh, you know, COVID, uh, the George Floyd, uh, the outrage and the movement that that started. And and also um, 2022 with the Dobbs decision, I think both of those summer of 2020 and then the summer of 2022 uh, were particular uh, moments 
of really, um, it almost seemed like there was an unleashed hatred uh, towards Christ church. And this report oh, and over the last six years shows that there have been attacks on churches in all 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia. So this is not just isolated, so to speak, to some blue enclave. You know, these aren't all taking place in New York City or Los Angeles. Uh, but there are attacks, again, over the last six years uh, in every single state. Um, and so, you, you, again, you're seeing this hostility being really unleashed against people of faith and against churches, uh, really in all four corners of the country. Yeah. And I noted, of course, in the report, we'll talk about some specific instances in a minute. But of course, you and I would say as evangelical Christians, not every um, congregation listed or identified in the report is necessarily fitting into the evangelical category or something like that. Um, but this matters to us as believers because we're speaking to the, the social conditions of America today. Uh, I noted, for example, that in California, uh, the proportion of acts was was quite blue, meaning a lot of uh, hostile acts against churches in the state of California. No doubt there's uh, complex causality here. There's numerous factors uh, entering into that reality. But, David, I would draw a line between myself um, the general hostility to the church and to biblical Christianity that we saw in lockdown era, for example, and uh, these these acts. I'm guessing there's got to be some kind of of connection between that ideological hostility and then that actual physical hostility. Do you think that holds true at all? Ab absolutely, Owen. And I think you know there's a lot of takeaways, and I think applications for a study like this. But increasingly, let, let's make the connection with these outward acts of hostility, vandalism, arson against actual physical church buildings, and then the the ideology that we saw exhibited by folks like, you know, then Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York or Gavin Newsom in California. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is we live in an age uh, when we, we have Pew Research actually to back us up on this. There are more people today that identify as religiously unaffiliated or the religious nuns uh, that at any point in our nation's history. And so what happens uh, when you have more people than ever before identifying as none? Well, what happens, and I think, I think this is a really crucial part of this, is that there are more people today uh, than ever before that don't understand basic Christian commitments. Yeah. Uh, not, you know, a lot of people today not only look at Christian ideas and doctrines as outdated or old school or a little weird or kooky, no, increasingly a, a, growing port, a growing portion of the society looks at Christians as dangerous, mm. as bigoted, as subversive, as dangerous, as those who need to be driven out of the public square from polite company. And, and I think we really saw that uh, during COVID, especially. I'm thinking of, again, Gavin Newsom, uh, just uh, complete um, uh, unawareness of just basic Christian commitments. And I think that was reflected in executive orders that wouldn't allow churches to gather, even let churches sing or chant um, uh, or recite uh, creeds and things like that. And so I do think as, um, and I have the number in front of me, Owen, uh, last year, it was 28% of the American public po population, according to Pew, identified as religiously unaffiliated. Mm. Well, when you have about a third of the population that has nothing to do with Christianity, well, those of us who uh, retain our Christian identity, again, we increasingly not just look weird, we look dangerous. We do. And when you're losing the vestiges of a strong Christian religious influence in a society. And we haven't lost them altogether. Actually, I think America is a strange and uneasy marriage to this day. It's a bit of a difficult marriage between a kind of Judeo-Christian worldview and a secular pagan worldview. And, and there's a lot of ebb and flow on both sides of that. But what happens when you lose your grip on meaningful um, Christian understanding of the human person in the public square? is you're going to lose your grip on human dignity. You're, you're going to lose a basic sense of, of kindness. Part of what the Baptist tradition actually has promoted for centuries, uh, almost 500 years now, has, for example, been religious liberty and the yes. right understanding of tolerance of, of different uh, religions and faiths and these sorts of things. That's partly because Baptists, as you well know, uh, were a persecuted people for hundreds of years, even following the Reformation. So... David, I, I think we're losing um, even that 
that good sense of tolerance or religious liberty or kindness in our society. And people aren't staying neutral, are they? They're, they're attacking, they're vandalizing, uh, they're, they're doing it online, and then they're doing it physically, aren't they? No, they are. And, and, and as, a, as someone who appreciates Baptist history, you'll, you'll appreciate this. Actually, this past weekend from the moment we're recording this uh, podcast episode, I had uh, a breakfast with a guy I went to Southern Seminary with who's now pastoring a church in Massachusetts uh, that had uh, been pastored by Isaac Backus at one point uh, a long time ago. And we actually had a wonderful conversation about religious freedom. Uh, but you're right. You know, folks like Isaac Backus in Massachusetts and New England area or John Leland in Virginia, uh, you know, the, part of the Baptist tradition for centuries now has been this plea for toleration. Mm. And uh, increasingly, because um, let me just define the term real quick, yeah. you know, religious freedom. We talk about it all the time. What is religious freedom? Well, as a Baptist, I would, and not just as a Baptist, as an American, mm -hmm. uh, this has been the understanding, again, since our founding. Religious freedom is the freedom to believe what you want to in terms of doctrine and theology and the freedom to order your life in accordance with those deeply held beliefs. Mm. I think you and I have talked about this before, but I think it was really under the Obama administration where the language of religious freedom or religious freedom really actually kind of was replaced by freedom of, for, of worship. Mm. Uh, the idea that you can do kind of what you want to in the four walls of your church, mosque, or synagogue, but when you leave the, the parking lot, you kind of enter the neutral public square, so to speak, which we know that's a lie. Mm -hmm. um, but I think increasingly... Uh, without that reference, uh, without that history, well, it, a lot of people, if you disagree with me in matters of specifically Christian sexual ethics, again, you're not just different than me. Uh, you're someone who must hate me. Uh, and therefore, uh, we can't even coexist. You know, oh, and one thing I'll throw in, you know, yeah. as we're recording this late February, um, the Supreme Court recently just heard a case from Missouri. Uh, they had to dismiss it on a technicality, but Justice Alito made the point uh, that you actually had in math in Missouri, uh, you had a the situation it was a uh, employment discrimination case where uh, the trial lawyer actually was asking potential jurors uh, if they had attended a church where homosexuality was taught as a sin, and based on their answer, he would strike uh, potential jurors. Uh, and the reason he gave was the plaintiff in that case was someone who identified as a lesbian. And of course, if you have a theological belief on homosexuality, you couldn't possibly be a fair juror. And Justice Alito rightfully said uh, that that is really, really problematic. Mm -hmm. But that's where we're moving uh, as we continue onward into kind of this post-Christian world. Yeah, that that was a really uh, rich answer in numerous dimensions historically, and, and Christians need to hear a lot more about uh, religious liberty, religious freedom, um, and, and Baptists, even young Baptists, need to know a lot more than they often do about the Baptist tradition of the last 500 years or so, and last 250 years in America in particular, and how uh, many Baptists courageously and against the wind fought for the kind of ideals you were just laying out. It is very interesting uh, to map what you just said, where uh, we've, we've historically as a country promoted uh, religious liberty, at least from the kind of mid uh, 19th century, we could say. We, we had an established church in different parts of the colonies, but then that morphs into early to, to mid 19th century into religious freedom, um, what we could call tolerance or that sort of thing. And then that morphs into um, freedom of worship, as you talked about in the Obama era, where you can, you can gather in the four walls of your building, and that's great, but you're not supposed to take your faith outside of the four walls of that building. Uh, as you, as you rightly said, well said. And then what we saw with lockdowns, I think a lot was happening with COVID and, and churches and society, and we're not going to try to sort all that out. But I think you put your finger on something really important there, a third development. Um, that was that you don't necessarily have freedom of worship. So from religious liberty mm -hmm. to uh, freedom of worship to not freedom of worship, um, churches were actually presented in California, in New York and elsewhere as a public danger. It wasn't just, hey, please don't gather because you might cough on someone. It was that churches were a danger and a hostile element in society. So, David, that was a really helpful mapping. And I think that's playing out uh, all around us today. No, no, it was. And if we can uh, stay there for just a moment, Owen, we need to realize it wasn't just uh, that kind of churches were being labeled as dangerous to their communities and whatnot. Two, two points to make. One, because I during COVID, during 
uh, that time, I was here at Family Research Council, and a lot of my work was trying to help pastors to think well through things. And some of the most heroic uh, caring of neighbor that took place during COVID was these churches uh, that were providing uh, uh, free breakfast and free lunch to essential hospital workers. And, you know, the, uh, churches were the first uh, once that we started doing testing around this country. You had a lot of churches use their parking lots for testing. Mm. So everyone in the community could be tested for COVID-19. And so actually you had churches doing a lot, some of the, mo- the best good uh, that was done was actually from churches. But not only that, uh, to the kind of going off the point you just made, Owen, is that uh, once we realized that, you know, tens of millions of people weren't going to die, uh, when things started to open up kind of in late May, June of 2020, uh, what we saw was churches um, specifically being ex- uh, discriminated against. Uh, tattoo parlors and abortion clinics and uh, liquor stores were allowed to open in Nevada. Uh, they allowed casinos to open up to 50% capacity, uh, which in some of those very large casinos meant thousands of people could go inside. And yet churches were held to a hard cap of, I think, 250 people, regardless of the size of your church. And so it was interesting when society started to open back up again, everybody was allowed to open back up again Um and if you wanted to participate in a Black Lives Matter protest, mm-hmm. by all means, tens of thousands of people could join in. Uh, but if you wanted to go worship God, mm. uh, you were held to a very different standard. And so I think that does show, kind of going back to the report, uh, yeah. the the hostility uh, manifested during COVID towards people of faith, I think, has carried over uh, in the years since then that's really documented in this FRC report that is now translated into these outward vandalism, arson, assaults, interruption of worship services, and things of that nature. I think you're right, you're dead right. Yeah, the report is called, again, Hostility Against Churches is on the Rise in the United States. It's found at uh, familyresearchcouncil.org. It's by Ariel Del Turco and my dear friend David Clausen, an expert on these matters on religious liberty in the public square from a Christian worldview is speaking to these things, taking his time to do so. We're very thankful for that. And yes, David, I, I think we got to recognize that uh, uh, there's a direct connection between uh, ideology and physicality. Ideological hostility is yielding physical hostility. And uh, there's a lot of heartbreaking uh, elements in this report. Um, you, you have all these different instances of churches who are going through um, uh, attacks, who have been vandalized, who have uh, had things stolen from them. And what, one of the things I really like about uh, this FRC document is that it um, it makes this clear. So, for example, just to read from from one selection here uh, in the FRC report, Convent Baptist Church, Leesville, South Carolina, January 5th, 2023. A church bus was completely burned to its frame, the report reads. The fire caused $77,000 in damages to the bus and an additional $15,000 in damages to the church building. Bright Light Baptist Church, Tacoma Park, Maryland, January 7, 2023. A person threw rocks through a stained glass window. St. Mary Catholic Church, last one I'll read, Escondido, California, January 9 to 10, 2023. The church was vandalized on consecutive days by the same man. On the first day, he threw a bottle at a statue of Mary, damaging it. On the second day, he threw an object at the church door's glass windows, shattering them. What I think is so helpful about this accumulation of these reports is that um, taken alone, you, you might brush them off. You might wave a hand at them. Well, right. it's a fallen world and people do bad stuff and that's that's sad, but we move on. And and actually we do have to move on and it is a fallen world. Absolutely. We're fighting <laughs> spiritual powers and principalities, Ephesians 6, 10 to 19. But when you aggregate these reports, you see, whoa, 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 whoa. This is a trend. There are eight times the number of hostile attacks against churches from 2018. And I'm really thankful that FRC did the hard work uh, to, to accumulate this data. That's very important, isn't it? No, it is. And I think the, the, the point of this is, you know, you could maybe brush one or two of these inc- incidences off as, well, maybe it was, I think like one of them, for example, was a college prank. You had some guys that a, in, a, in New York uh, defaced some statues of Mary and they turned up in a dorm room or something to that effect. But really the, the cumulative effect uh, of seeing this, is, and it's, you know, there's 40 pages of footnotes, so anyone can tr- track all this down. It's all been reported by local media is I think it shows the trend, Owen. It shows that there's been an acceleration 
And again, a lot of the, the motives are unknown. Um, some of them are, are, have been investigated by local law enforcement as uh, potential hate crimes. Um, you know, we don't know a lot of them. Some of them we do know that it is related to actual politics. Um, a, a couple incidences that I noted, uh, Owen, was specifically um, in Ohio. Uh, there was a couple of churches that had signs on the church property uh, that were uh, encouraging people to vote no. Uh, against the abortion referendum that unfortunately passed in Ohio that codified abortion in that state's constitution. And those signs were ripped down, thrown in a dumpster, and actually replaced uh, by signs from the other side of that campaign. So it shows someone actually put some thought uh, into that. Mm -hmm. And then I know in uh, Kentucky, uh, there was another incident uh, where uh, this would have been March 2023, uh, the day after the Kentucky legislature advanced a bill uh, to protect minor children from uh, cross-sex hormones and so-called gender-affirming care, mm. uh, that a sign at a church was defaced and someone wrote trans power uh, over the, the church sign. And so some of these, again, we a lot, the vast majority, we don't know exactly what the motive was, but some of these, it's interesting, though, when you see developments related to, say, abortion or issues of sexual ethics, uh, that when people get upset about those issues, who do they blame? Hmm. Well, they blame Christians. They blame the church. They blame so-called Christian nationalism. Hmm. And they take their anger out on the physical building of the church. So there is some connections related to those things that I think are just worth pointing out as well. They are. And if we verge beyond uh, attacks against church buildings here for a minute, you think about the different public shootings that are taking place around America. And you think about how often now um, the individual in, in question is is a self-identified transgender individual or, yeah. or gender fluid in some way. Uh, there are plenty of people who don't uh, struggle with those issues who, who do terrible things in our world as well. But it does seem, David, like um, there is just rising madness around us. And, and I don't want to freak everybody out out there. I don't, I, I don't want to plunge us into despair and discouragement, but we do have to grapple with this. And, and just as we begin winding down in this uh, episode, we think about what I just referenced, Ephesians 6, uh, verse 10 and following. Finally, be strong in the Lord, Paul writes, and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And this verse in particular, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we, we will have diverse motives uh, in these individual instances, as you have said, absolutely. But as I read this report, uh, hostility against churches is on the rise. I thought to myself, at some level, uh, this is very definitely, I think, a campaign against uh, the church by Satan to dishearten us, um, to knock us off course. Y you know, you, you losing your church sign out front, you, your church having graffiti on it, that, that doesn't shut down your work. But what does it do? It knocks you off balance. It, it disheartens you. It discourages you. Someone's got to clean it up. Someone's got to go buy a new sign, et cetera, and so on. I just sense, David, that um, we really are seeing rising spiritual battle in our time. And we've got to be prepared for that, don't we? No, I, I agree with that 100 percent, Owen. And, and as you were uh, actually reading from Ephesians 6, I couldn't help it immediately. My mind went to John 15 and 16, uh, where Jesus himself, you know, the, he's the, the last night he's with the disciples right before they walk across the Kidron Valley into the Garden of Gethsemane, looks at his disciples, you know, final words uh, that he's about to say to them before he uh, goes to the garden. He says, uh, as they've persecuted me, they will persecute you. Mm. Uh, Jesus himself wanted his disciples moments before he would be betrayed uh, to be prepared for persecution. Uh, they didn't like me. They're not going to like you. They persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. Mm. And so I think Jesus himself is so gracious uh, in warning us. He doesn't want us to be caught off guard by these things. And so absolutely, these are uh, spiritual battles and the physical church building uh, across in a foyer at a, a, your local Baptist church, uh, those things are just, they, they represent to a lot of people kind of institutional religion. And in a post-Christian culture that we live in, Owen, the, really the last holdout 
uh, specifically on, say, maybe like the moral revolution, the LGBT yeah. revolution, really the last institutional holdout is the church. Mm. And so we shouldn't be surprised when so much ire and anger and uh, vitriol is directed towards the church. And I think that's a, a moment of choosing for many of us. And unfortunately, some churches have, in this moment are backing down and, and are uh, changing views on doctrine because they, they can't handle the, the, the pressure. Uh, but for those of us who are going to be faithful to Jesus, uh, this is a moment of testing. And uh, I pray that uh, we will all be found faithful. Yeah, I think that's a really important word. Um, it's not that the church is called to be a pack. It's not that pastors are called to to lead everybody in, in political efforts around the clock or something like this. But as you've pointed out a number of times, uh, rightly in this episode, churches are seen as agents of politics today in a way that many churches, including sound evangelical gospel preaching churches, a number of which are in this report, don't really that's not what they're out for. They're not, they're not first and foremost trying to take back America or something like this, but that is how they are perceived. So this is a good reminder. We have like four minutes here, David. This is a good reminder, uh, to us. I think I want to hear from you that we, we don't want to corrupt the gospel by politicizing it. So that's, that's one problem. On the other hand, no, no, oh, sorry. On the other hand, we don't want to shy away from the reality that if, if we are standing for marriage, for example, from a local church position, a pastor, let's say, or elders or something like this, or just members of the church, we may, we may have persecution from the local community. There may be people who target us, but, um, say a word to perhaps, um, Christians out there who are battling discouragement and maybe even fear, especially 2024 as the election ramps up. This really could, could increase in terms of fever pitch. What would you say to people in terms of a word of comfort and hope as we navigate this wildness today? Yeah, specifically to pastors. Actually, um, the morning, Owen, that we're recording this podcast, I, a good friend that I went to seminary with uh, was interviewing uh, a couple days ago for a Southern Baptist Church in Tennessee. And in that, the search committee actually asked him the question, kind of where he feels that, uh, the, what's the place of politics in the pulpit? And he told me what his answer was, which is it was a great answer. He said, you know, I don't think the pulpit is the place for politics. However, uh, if the word of God speaks to an issue, then I think that that issue needs to be spoken to. Uh, so if, you know, I, I'm preaching exegetically through Romans chapter one, I will preach uh, about homosexuality. If I'm preaching uh, through, let's, let's say, uh, Luke's gospel, and I get to Luke chapter one, verses 39 through 45, I will make applications to the pro-life issue because the Bible itself speaks to that. And so I just, I was so encouraged by that, brother. Um, and so to pastors, you know, just preach the word in and out of season, preach faithfully, exegetically through books of the Bible and trust the Lord uh, to bring the fruit. And just as an overall word of comfort, yes, we live um, in very interesting times. Uh, this is an election year. Everybody knows that. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're not called to get results, Owen. We're called to be faithful. Uh, and that's true for the, the stay at home mom. That's true for the guy working on a political campaign. All of us are called to be faithful. And as we do that, I think that's how we bring honor to the Lord uh, and we'll be rewarded for that. Amen. Well, I, I very much agree with you there. Um, it's so important, by the way, as we wrap here that um, that we promote a biblical worldview. And so a lot of folks out there might hear uh, the news that we've been sharing here, discussing on this episode, and they might think, ah, I got to do something. We got to turn back the tide. And there may be things that, you know, folks can do in an individual community. Of course, I'm not against that. I'm, I'm sure you aren't either. But the real calling of the, the normal Christian like you and me on a day by day basis is to cultivate deep faith in Christ by the grace of God. Think well, according to scripture, apply that faith as God gives us opportunity. And so I would say to people out there, uh, a great resource along those lines is the Center for Biblical Worldview at Family Research Council. David is the director of the Center for Biblical Worldview at FRC, uh, doing great work, producing great resources. And I would just simply remind Remind us that we are not called to a posture of making the world right by our own efforts. We are called to what David said there just a minute ago, daily faithfulness. Nothing super exciting, uh, nothing that usually lands on the evening news or a uh, viral moment on social media, but that daily faithfulness has a real effect. And, and Christ, Christ has promised, hasn't he, David, to build his church. The gates of hell, Matthew 16, 18, are not going to prevail over the church, are they? 
No, they're not. And uh, uh, just last year, and I, I got to preach there. Uh, they're at Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus actually uh, said those words that you just quoted. A lot of people don't realize, but you know that was actually known in the pagan ancient world as the gates of hell. Now, why would a Jewish rabbi uh, go out of his way to kind of an unclean place with his disciples? Well, really to make the point, mm. uh, who is what his identity was, and that this movement that he was starting, no matter what this earth throws at, no matter what the demons throw at it. It will not prevail. And so the I just imagine the encouragement the disciples got from that moment. And I think we, too, should get that same encouragement uh, that when we're on the side of King Jesus, uh, we're going to be all right. Amen. So if you're out there and you've listened to this great conversation with with David Clausen of Family Research Council, I would just say, even if your church, let's say this, your church building has experienced uh, one of the acts of vandalism or something similar. I'm guessing there were a lot of uh, hostile acts against churches out there that did not make their way into this report. Um, sure. Where where there is smoke, there tends to be fire. And so um, if you're out there and, and you have navigated this or, or you're just you're just feeling like the world is crazy these days and everybody's lost their mind and it's very hard to be a Christian, um, I would just say to you, take heart in the Lord. Uh, Christ is building his church. Uh, God is going to make all things right. We're not the ones, though, who make the world right. It's Jesus who has to do that. David, thank you so much for pointing us to Christ, ultimately. Uh, thank you uh, in, in terms of your proxy representation here to Family Research Council for this excellent report. Uh, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Always a joy, brother. Thanks so much. David Clausen is director of the Center for Biblical Worldview at Family Research Council. It's been my joy to talk with him about this important report, Hostility Against Churches is on the Rise in America. My name is Owen Strand. I remind you in closing to look to the grace and truth that is in Jesus Christ. This is an unsteady and wild world, but there is infinite grace and total truth in Christ and Christ alone. God bless you.